Good morning, everyone. We're going to be starting our program now and asking if everyone can come to their seats, please. Thanks so much. I'm David Grossman. Uh, I'm Vice President for Social Health and Equity and work with our national team uh, in addressing issues uh, of social importance in our society and uh, working with our communities. I'm very, very gratified that you all made time today to join us for this really important event. And what I'd like to do uh, is first acknowledge that we have over 500 people viewing this event online. Thanks to all of you for joining us and for being a part of this today. We'd like to start our program off by introducing uh, Ruth Williams Brinkley, who's our regional president of the Mid-Atlantic States region, senior executive of Kaiser Permanente, uh, to welcome us. Ruth. Okay, um, can everyone hear me? All right. Good morning. Thank you, David, for the introduction. And I want to thank everyone for being here this morning. As David said, I am Ruth Williams Brinkley, the uh, uh, president of Kaiser Permanente's Mid-Atlantic region. And um, we're just delighted that you're here. It's a somber subject, the subject of reducing gun violence in America. And we're going to discuss the role of the healthcare sector. We do have a role. Um, we are gathered at Kaiser Permanente Center for Total Health. And I hope if you have time, you will take, a, take an opportunity to look around. We're very proud of the center. We are located here in Washington, DC. And our Capitol Hill Medical Center, which is located adjacent to where we sit today, is a testament to Kaiser Permanente's commitment to addressing the total health of our members and all people in the communities that we serve. Throughout the medical center, we provide a full spectrum of high quality uh, care for our members and services for our members, from primary care to advanced urgent care to multi-specialty and subspecialty care. And where we sit today in our Center for Total Health we have a lot of meeting space, and we're, we have a lot of meetings here. We have a lot of events here. It's a gathering place for the community. This is also a thought leadership and innovation space that we're very proud of. This space serves as a catalyst for impactful dialogues, uh, dialogue around many topics, quite, quite honestly. It serves as a catalyst for cal collaboration between community and Kaiser Permanente, and we work in partnership with our community and with other organizations to improve the health outcomes of those we serve in this great nation. The Kaiser Permanente Center for Total Health is an important way that we acknowledge the fact that most, are, most of a person's health is not determined within any medical facility. I think we all know that, but just as a reminder, 80% of what happens to a person health, person's health happens in their communities. Um, and so it is our duty as a healthcare organization to seek solutions to problems that impact people's health, and this includes gun violence. Gun violence recent, recently became the single leading cause of death among children and teenagers. It's a sobering point. And as the pages continue to unfold, what we see and what we don't see in the headlines, the lives of too many of our young people are tragically being cut short. And it's just not young, it's every age. Each victim of gun violence represents an individual tragedy and also a community tragedy and a social calamity. When gun violence happens to someone, their hopes and dreams are lost. They are never given the opportunity to realize their potential. They lose the opportunity to contribute to their families, their loved ones, their communities, and our society in their own unique and essential ways. 
That's putting a face, a human face, on gun violence. So solving for gun violence is complex and it's crucial. That's why we're here today. The health sector has a key role to play in both prevention and the design of comprehensive clinical care associated with gun violence. Getting to the root causes and creating solutions that everyone can support is an ambitious aim, yet we must strive to do it and we will do it together. Kaiser Permanente has long been an active participant in the space of gun violence prevention. As part of our commitment to health, we are eager to do even more to ensure that we can move forward on this vital issue as a country. Today, we will be making some exciting announcements around gun violence uh, prevention research. You might ask, well, what does that mean? I'm gonna talk about that in just a second. Through the Center for Gun Violence Research and Education, we will support research into promising solutions to prevent firearm injuries with the same rigor with the same clinical expertise that we use to study strokes, that we use to study cancer, heart disease, and other leading causes of death. Thank you for being here today. We will begin our event with an important message from Deborah Howry, Acting Principal Deputy Director with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, who is going to speak more about what research to prevent gun violence will look like. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to speak with you all today. My years as an emergency physician have made preventing firearm violence very important and real to me. I've seen firsthand the devastating effects of firearm violence on individuals, families, and communities. These experiences underscore the need to continue our work to prevent this violence. It's great to see this event bring together health professionals and communities to talk about firearm-related injuries and violence. These sectors, along with many others, play an important role in prevention. With my time today, I'd like to talk about the data and trends, the role of healthcare in this public health crisis, and some of CDC's work in surveillance and research. Firearm injury and death have a tremendous impact on the safety and well being of Americans. Firearm related injuries take the lives of more than 133 people in the U.S. every day, and they are among the five leading causes of death for people ages 1 to 44. In 2021, more than 48,000 firearm-related deaths occurred in the U.S., and more than half were by suicide. From 2019 to 2020, the firearm homicide rate increased 35 percent and then increased another 8 percent in 2021. The firearm suicide rate also increased by 8 percent in 2021. In the emergency room, I also saw the serious impact on firearm violence on those who survived. More people suffered non-fatal firearm-related injuries than die, and many of these victims have lifelong physical and emotional consequences, ranging from cognitive problems to paralysis. These incidents affect the families who love and care for them. Firearm violence impacts the sense of safety in communities and cost the U.S. tens of billions of dollars each year in medical and lost productivity costs. At CDC, our public health approach to preventing death and injury from firearms focuses on data collection and surveillance, research to understand and apply effective prevention strategies, and cross-sector collaborations. To help communities identify effective violence prevention strategies, CDC developed online resources based on the best available evidence. The strategies in the, these resources address multiple forms of community violence, including 
meeting the needs of those at greatest risk through outreach programs and hospital community partnerships that provide support and connections to services. Improving the physical conditions within communities through strategies like cleaning and greening vacant lots, which can increase opportunities for positive social interactions and decrease opportunities for violence. And lastly, addressing the underlying conditions that contribute to violence with policies that strengthen economic and household stability. This can help lift families out of poverty, reduce stress, and enhance positive outcomes. Healthcare professionals and systems play an important role in helping reduce violence in communities. Using a trauma-informed approach, hospitals can improve patient-clinician encounters and lessen re-traumatization. Hospital-based violence intervention programs facilitate trauma-informed care to the patient while in the hospital. These programs identify patients at risk of repeat violent injury and link them with hospital and community-based resources to address underlying risk factors for violence. For example, Caught in the Crossfire is a peer intervention that meets young shooting survivors where they are, whether it's at home, at their hospital bedside, or at school. When this intervention was studied during post-injury six-month evaluation period, the youth in the intervention were 70% less likely to be arrested for any offense compared with youth not in the program. Hospital community partnerships can strengthen connections between the acute treatment of violence-related injuries and community assistance to prevent future injuries and health risk behaviors. Safe ER Teens is an emergency department intervention for youth that uses motivational interviewing, skill building, and referral to services. This program has shown reductions in perpetration and victimization of peer violence, alcohol use, and dating violence, as well as increases in confidence to avoid fighting. Clinicians can also bring their expertise to discussions on accurate, timely local data that are essential to understand inequities in violence, guide prevention decisions, and enable ongoing evaluation and health system quality improvement. The Cardiff model is a framework for partnerships between healthcare, law enforcement, public health, and community organizations. Using emergency department and law enforcement data on the location and timing of violence to guide efforts. This model was associated with a 42% reduction in hospital admissions for violence-related injuries and saved an estimated $15 in health system costs for every dollar spent. Healthcare providers can also discuss secure storage of firearms with patients. The Emergency Department Counseling on Access to Lethal Means program trains psychiatric emergency clinicians to provide lethal means counseling and safe storage boxes to parents of youth receiving care for suicidal behavior. Among parents who indicated the presence of guns in the home at pre-test, 100% reported guns were locked up at post-test. CDC's Injury Center has studied violence and its lifelong impacts for 30 years. CDC is supporting 20 extramural R01 grants to evaluate innovative and promising violence prevention strategies and to inform the development of new ones. Through this work, we will be able to better understand the characteristics of firearm violence, risk and protective factors, and the effectiveness of interventions to prevent firearm violence. For example, one group is evaluating INT-ER ACT, INTERACT, an intervention designed to reduce risk behaviors, firearm violence, and other factors among youth seeking treatment in an urban emergency department. This study uses behavioral therapy, tailored messages, and GPS notifications when participants enter areas they've identified put them at higher risk for firearm violence. Another is collecting patient, clinician, and leader perspectives on clinical practices for identifying and engaging individuals at risk of firearm suicide. They will identify opportunities for practice improvement and pilot intervention strategies in three healthcare systems. The results will fill the critical need for patient-centered strategies to identify 
and engage patients at high risk of firearm suicide. Since 2000, CDC has funded Youth Violence Prevention Centers, or YVPCs, across the country to partner with communities that are experiencing high rates of violence. YVPCs work with local partners to develop, implement, and evaluate strategies to reduce youth violence and the negative health consequences associated with exposure to violence. In Flint, Michigan, the YVPC developed community collaborations that resulted in the healthy development of youth in neighborhoods. Through implementing six preventative strategies, the program had a 38% decrease in youth assault-related injuries and a 25% decrease in youth's likelihood of being victims of a violent assault in the intervention area than in a comparison area. We are excited to help move the field forward through innovative research on the drivers of firearm violence to inform the development of new prevention strategies. And through rigorous evaluation of prevention programs, policies, and practices, we make sure that they are having the intended effects. We are committed to being a partner with each of you as we collectively advance this work to improve the health and safety of our communities. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Dr. Auri, and uh, thanks to the CDC for their really important support of this work. Um, we know this is not easy work to do, and we also know that many of you in this audience are recipients and participants in these types of, of studies and certainly express our appreciation to you as well. Next up, uh, I'd like to introduce our Chief Health Officer of Kaiser Permanente, and uh, Dr. Bashara Shukir, who is unable to join us today in person, but will be addressing us live uh, virtually in just one second. In addition, following uh, Dr. Shukir, uh, we will also be hearing from Fatima Lauren Dreyer, who's the Executive Director of Hospitals Alliance uh, for Violence Interventions. Um, together, they'll be making a very important announcement that um, we're really pleased to hear. Bashara, uh, please join us. All right. Good morning, David. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you, Deborah, for uh, helping to ground us uh, for the conversations ahead. Uh, and thank you for being a steadfast partner in finding meaningful solutions to addressing this public health crisis in this country, gun violence. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not uh, able to join you all in person today. After three years of avoiding COVID, I did test positive uh, last week, fully vaccinated, double boosted. So luckily I had uh, very mild symptoms. I'm sad I'm uh, missing everyone in person in DC, but I'm so thrilled to be uh, joining everyone uh, virtually. Uh, we are convening today because Kaiser Permanente believes that together with all healthcare organizations, we must do more to prevent gun violence and to educate on its health implications for our society. Uh, it's only January 26, and there has been already at least 40 separate mass shootings in the United States, many taking place in communities served by Kaiser Permanente. Um, in the first few days of the new year, four people were shot, one fatally at a shopping mall in Baltimore, Last week in Tulare County, California, an entire family was killed, including a 10-month-old child. Saturday night in Monterey Park, California, 11 people dancing in the lunar year. Um, um, celebrations were killed and more were injured. And less than, 20, uh, less than 48 hours later, in Half Moon Bay, also in California, seven people were shot and killed while at work on a Monday afternoon. A few hours later in Oakland, seven people were shot at a gas station only a few miles from our headquarters. Any one of these tragedies is shocking. Collectively, they are a symptom of a terrible problem that we must solve. And it's not just about mass shootings. Deborah mentioned that firearm injuries claims the lives of more than 48,000 Americans each year. Um, and it is the leading cause of premature death in the United States. It is the leading cause of death among children and teens. That's in addition 
than estimated annual cost of gun injuries exceeding $229 billion. That's about 1.4% of our total GDP. As an organization, we believe that gun violence, while all too common today, is not an intractable problem. We believe solutions can be designed and implemented that will save lives. And it's because of those beliefs that we are committing $25 million over the next five years to advance gun violence prevention through care innovation, research, and education. I'm also proud to announce that Javi will be a key partner of ours in coordinating the efforts of our Center for Gun Violence Research and Education and will bring their subject matter and technical expertise in gun violence prevention to help develop a research agenda on gun violence that is broad and informed by those most impacted by violence. Kaiser Permanente and the Javi have been working together in the space for nearly 15 years now, and we have already seen the promising results of collaborative community-based support for gun violence prevention, and we know we can take this work even further, and we will. I am so excited about the role the Javi will play to connect Kaiser Permanente's clinical focus with their deep expertise in community-based violence prevention as we pursue a healthier future. And with that, I'll turn things over to Fatima to talk more about the road ahead of us. Fatima? Thank you so much, Dr. Kosher. Um, it's wonderful to see all of you here. My name is Fatima Loren Dreyer, Executive Director of the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention. We at the Javi are so incredibly proud of this partnership with Kaiser Permanente. KP's historic $25 million commitment comes at a critical time in this country. Every day, we are reminded that gun violence is a public health emergency and that the crisis is deeply entwined with systemic racism in this country. And so hospital-based violence intervention programs, like Caught in the Crossfire, have spent decades focused on patients of color who have borne the brunt of this crisis. Patients who enter our emergency departments and trauma bays with bullets in their bodies. Our task is to change the trajectory of our patients' lives by not only attending to the physical wounds, but also providing comprehensive wraparound care to address the social determinants of health. When we shift economic conditions and housing and safety of our pa patients, we can have impact. When we allow credible messengers with lived experience to lead the work, we can have impact. When we collaborate with street outreach and other promising community-based violence intervention models, we can have impact. But our years of experience have taught us that research is lagging behind community wisdom about what works. And it is time at last to close that gap. This historic investment comes at a critical time in our country. The violence prevention field has been neglected for far too long. In a 2017 analysis conducted by the RAND Corporation, they looked at how public funding to support research to stop all the leading causes of violence and death in this country have impacted research in the long term. So for example, people who die of Parkinson's disease in the US and for every death, we spend somewhere around $7,000 to research and stop future deaths. For HIV, through an incredible history of activism, we spend $180,000 in research for every death in the United States. So what about gun violence? For gun violence, our government spends $63 per death, only $63 per death. It's astronomical and it needs to stop. We need greater investment in research. 
The racial equity focus of the center comes at a critical moment in our country. We cannot assume mere increases in funding will necessarily address racial disparities. The field needs greater investment in community participatory practices. The field needs an entire generation of researchers who engage in power sharing with the communities they serve. The field needs greater investment in robust, rigorous implementation science and shared measures focusing on reducing violence, certainly, but also the health and well being of our patients, and for that matter, the violence prevention professionals who serve them. The field needs actionable research that can help scale and support health focused solutions and health focused policies scale. The center's focus on bipartisanship comes at a critical time. We have seen greater bipartisan support for public health approaches to gun violence. Scores of Republican supporters of local, state, and federal uh, approaches, and we need to continue to support that momentum. The Javi is ready and poised to meet this critical moment as KP's co-lead. Our relationship with Visor is longstanding. In fact, KP is part of Javi's origin story. In 2009, KP funded a visionary group of trauma surgeons and ED docs, community leaders, and violence prevention specialists to convene and ultimately launch what was once called the National Network of Hospital-Based Violence Intervention Programs. Now we have a presence as the Javi in over 85 cities in the United States and beyond and offer training and peer learning, policy development, strategic communications, and research. We support hundreds of violence prevention specialists and have worked in coalition to secure Medicaid reimbursement for violence prevention services in five states. We have recently published 42 standards for HVIPs across eight domains to clarify the critical components of our model. Health Resources in Action, our fiscal sponsor and partner in racial and health equity work, is a public health institute that has funded over 1,200 research studies focused on clinical, population health, health systems across a range of health areas. They are experts in implementation science, and we are excited to work together to advance the aims of the center. The Javi has also had incredible national partnerships across a range of sectors, from the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma to the National Institute of Criminal Justice Reform. We participate in national coalitions like the Trauma Prevention Coalition and the Coalition to Advance Public Safety, and most recently completed our work with the White House Civic Initiative. But most of all, we deeply understand what is at stake in the expansion of this center. We see the opportunity to use the guiding light of our values of leadership, racial equity, rigor, and community power to be innovative and bring critical new conversations to the field. We cannot embark on this journey without you. So please go to the Hobby website and join our, waiting, our mailing list. In the coming months, we will continue to share updates about our progress and opportunities to engage with the center. On behalf of the Hobby board, staff, HVIP members, I want to thank Kaiser Permanente for the opportunity. I look forward to working towards, together towards igniting transformation in the field. Thank you. It's now my distinct honor to welcome Dr. Georges Benjamin to the stage. Dr. Benjamin, Executive Director of the Health, excuse me, the American Public Health Association. He's a board certified internal medicine physician and a former secretary of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. His academic career has consisted of a full range of academic endeavors from teaching, policy research, academic program development, and management. Benjamin has combined his practice and academic experience as an emergency physician with public health to become one of the nation's expert in public health emergency preparedness. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Benjamin to the stage. Thank you so much for being with us. All about injury prevention. Good morning, everybody. 
Let me um, thank you very much for allowing me to spend a few moments with you. And let me just say that I was asked to come here today to talk about why this matters, why this historic investment. And I just want to take you back. Um, uh, I, I remember um, I was a health commissioner here in, in Washington, D.C. in 1990 when Washington was considered the murder capital of America. We had drive-by shootings. I was at the city hospital and D.C. general at the time, and it was a real tragedy. I went over to become the health commissioner. We were really active, involved in trying to uh, address uh, firearm um, injury in the country and death. Um, and then we were all, you know, the whole field was really revved up to do research and to ask the right questions and to try to come up with solutions. Um, and then, tragically, we got shut down. Uh, at the national level, the Congress decided that we federal government should not invest in firearm research. And you saw a precipitous drop in research, in training, um, in publications uh, in our country. And we lost many, many years, over 20 years, of knowledge development. So this investment today by Kaiser Permanente is historic. While we have certainly now allow the federal government, both CDC and NIA, to do much more research, um, that investment is about $25 million a year, 12 and a half to CDC, about 12 and a half to NIH. Um, but think about it now. This private sector investment from a health sector is extraordinarily important. That's a fair amount of money to begin to jumpstart the knowledge development that we need. And you know, we've obviously tragically heard about these mass shootings that, that uh, hit the news in the last few days. Uh, but we also know that there's, there are, are tragedies that occur each and every day in our country. And I, I have to ask myself, when you just look at 48,000 people dying every year, I want to give you a visual of what that really means. That's an airplane falling out of the sky every single day. Let me repeat that. That's an airplane falling out of the sky every single day. And we know some things about this. We know that it's preventable, that a vast majority of, of this stuff is preventable. Now, the other tragedy, of course, we know is that it is a big issue for our young folks. And several years ago, our young folks were dying um, disproportionately and prematurely from automobile crashes. And our society said, enough of this. We got together in a multi-sectorial way. We looked at the research. We looked at the data. We made automobiles safer. We made people safer in their automobiles and trucks and everything else on the road. And then we made the community safer for people and cars in it. And we can do the same for firearm-related violence. And in particular, the health sector here not only has the opportunity to, to, to do better treatment and care, et cetera, but this partnership that Kaiser is proposing to really address community intervention is so extraordinarily important. Now, I remember the times in the hospital, at the city hospital here, where someone would come in shot with a survivable gunshot wound, and they would go back out, and then they'd come back dead or someone else would come back dead. Um, so there's an opportunity for us to intervene at a variety of levels as part of this process. So I just want to again want to just thank Kaiser for the work that you're doing. I want to talk about how important this is and the knowledge that will be gained by this investment is immeasurable. I want to thank you very much. Thank you. Per beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Uh, it means so much to us to hear from you and for your affirmation of the importance of this work as we move forward. We next, um, we are going to um, move uh, into a set of panels uh, with leading experts in the field who will be discussing uh, different dimensions of this problem, but also the solutions and what we know. Um, we have had a little bit of an adjustment to the agenda this morning because, unfortunately, one of our speakers was 
uh, unable to arrive in, uh, in time. So as a result, uh, Fatima will be moderating this first panel and introducing the panelists. Um, and the, the first panel will be discussing ecosystems for community safety and the health sector's role in gun violence prevention. So I uh, invite the panelists to come up onto the stage, please. And uh, Fatima will do the introductions. Thank you. Hello there, I'm back. <laughs> I am joined by uh, incredible human beings um, and dear friends. Uh, so just please join me in, in welcoming our first panel. Uh, we have on the stage Greg Jackson, uh, Executive Director of the Community Justice Action Fund. He's a survivor of gun violence, a community organizer, and an advocate for public health approaches to violence. We have uh, Tim Daly, who's the director of the um, Joyce Foundation's Gun Violence Prevention and Justice Reform Program, focusing on building safe and just communities in the Great Lakes region. He also serves as chair of the Funder Collaborative, Fund for a Safer Future. And um, I'm going to get teary-eyed. Dr. Thea James, uh, <laughs> Vice President of Mission and Associate Chief Medical Officer at Boston Medical Center, Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Boston University School of Medicine, as well as an attending physician in the emergency department. She is also a board member, long-standing board member of the hobby. Thank you all for being here. Let's dive right in. So we are talking about um, community violence. We want to really understand how, how does the country understand this problem currently? And what do you think needs to change? And Thea, I'll start with you. Uh, thank you, Fatima. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I think one of the things we need to do is start with um, the dominant narrative about gun violence, particularly in communities. Um, the narrative about um, who the victims are. Um, and uh, it generally is not understood. And if we're honest, you know, most people think that victims of violence um, are people who either, either caused it or involved in some negative behavior of some sort, but they don't really understand the root causes of it. You know, they, people don't generally make the connection between if you look at where a majority of community um, violence occurs geographically in any city across the United States, it actually is the same geographic area where people um, did worse, uh, fared worse during the pandemic. It's also where lower health status is, where lower um, education attainment is, and where lower incomes are. And that is the, you know, the foundation of it all anyway. We're not talking about economic justice at this moment, but that's what it is. People cannot prioritize health and cannot thrive because they're prioritizing survival. And so the only way to learn about this, the only way to be able to do research that is actually um, useful to um, eliminate you know, this issue is you have to engage. We have to engage with the people um, it's happening to. We have, to, they, you know, we are well-meaning people. And when well-meaning people see people suffering, or seeing people have gaps and whatever, they, you know, we sit in a room, people get at a table, and they decide what these people need. But only these people know what they need. And um, I think that we have to sort of like shift, you know, leverage that value that they bring and shift the power, you know, to them as well. Shifting power, Greg, that sounds like something an organizer might help accomplish. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your work and how it connects. How do you make something like understanding violence prevention actionable? Yeah, um, I do want to honor and thank Thea for what she shared because we do have a real challenge in America where victims and survivors are seen as part of the problem and not part of the solution. 
Uh, and I learned that firsthand. Um, I was shot in April 2013. And I remember, uh, even though I was a bystander, when I entered the hospital, I wasn't met with my nurses or doctors. I was met with three investigators that interrogated me about my whereabouts and where was my gun and what did I do to, to, to deserve this, this um, near fatal situation. And after my interrogation, um, the bullet that hit two arteries I only had about 26 minutes left to live, according to my surgeon. And so I could have lost my life um, while being interrogated. And I think a big challenge we're seeing in America is that it's solved the crime and then, hey, maybe we'll save a life or two. Um, and that approach has failed. And I think it's primarily failed because we haven't looked at the true leaders of the movement, which are the survivors, which are the families that have lost uh, lost loved ones, which are the communities that are navigating through this trauma every day. And so at Community Justice, we, we take pride in that, that our number one priority is empowering those who have been impacted to lead the charge. And that starts with our staff, but it goes all the way down to our volunteers, to our coalitions, to the people we put before Congress, to people we put before the President of the United States in the White House. We know that survivors are the ones that need to consistently be creating a table, not invited to the table. Um, and since then, we've seen tremendous strides. We've watched uh, funding for violence intervention programs go from 16 million to now about 14 billion, right? And the big change has been the organizing that we've done and the empowerment we've done to leaders and organizers and activists, and most importantly, survivors across the country. And so um, I think that's something to continue to lean into, and I'm excited about this partnership because service providers are a huge part of the solution and of the folks who should be at the table. Because um, in my eyes, they're surviving this trauma too. Thank you. Tim, you come from the philanthropy side of the house and uh, Joyce Foundation has um, been a, a philanthropic organization that's focused on gun violence for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you've learned about the funding landscape and how you and the Joyce Foundation has, has sought to shape it. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, it's been mentioned earlier that we're starting to learn a lot about gun violence and what the potential solutions and interventions are. But the reality is, is that a lot of that public investment is relatively new, right? And at the Joyce Foundation and other philanthropies that we partner with at the Fund for a Safer Future and otherwise, you know, we have had to invest um, a significant amount of money to try and fill that gap. And uh, what we've learned along the way um, is that there are solutions, uh, number one. Uh, number two, mm -hmm. um, there are um, a, a lot of misconceptions um, about uh, the issue, uh, including um, what are the protective effects of guns or not? Um, what are the risk factors of gun ownership and possession or not? Yeah. Um, and, and also then what it is, what are the policies that could potentially work to close it? So I think the things that we have been focusing on over the last couple of years and the things that we have learned is what, what is it that we can do to scale out the solutions that we believe um, could make a difference? Thank you. I'm going to bring things back to you, Thera, um, because I, I want to help thread the needle a little bit more uh, around uh, people talk about health equity. And uh, this is, I think, a big movement in the health sector. Uh, but there are, um, there's health equity with a small age and there's health equity with a big age. <laughs> and I, I would um, count you as a, a national leader in health equity with a big age. What does it mean to, to do transformative systems change work around health equity? And how does that impact root causes in communities? So I would say that, I honestly want to say that th this is not theory and this is proof of concept. And it actually started with the violence program. We started in our own hospital. You know, young people coming in um, with gunshot wounds and, you know, again, a dominant narrative uh, driving how people interacted with them. But when the mayor asked us to start a program, I didn't really kind of didn't know where to begin. And there, there was very little research out there and only three hospital-based violence intervention programs in the country and I read some literature that was being um, published about measures of success. And the study was only measuring re-injury, re-incarceration, dropped out of school. I couldn't understand what the, you know, the intentionality was or if there was intentionality. And so we decided um, we would do something very different. And honestly, I don't want to, you know, take too much time, but just reading their tattoos told the stories to me, you know, living is hard, dying is easy. Um, 
death is nothing but to live defeated is to die every day. What it said to me is that, you know, these kids were hopeless. So we generally just got to know them. We used the violence interventionists to establish a rapport with them. They did everything they said they would do. And most of all, asked these kids, you know, if they had their wishes, what would they do? What would they want? And so um, that's what we did. And you see their lives transform into, you know, people who have they become entrepreneurs, you know, they have MBAs, they have all kinds of things. But translating that into a systemic way, for example, in our own hospital, which is a safety net hospital, we don't look at them from a place of a deficit because we recognize the situations they're in were created. Um, there's a quote here from Health Affairs that I always like to refer to. It says, systemic racism is so embedded in systems that it often is assumed to reflect the natural, inevitable order of things. Mm. So we don't buy this thing that you can't change it. It's, you know, um, like boiling the ocean. When people come into our hospital, our intentionality is to alter their life course trajectory. So um, we invest in um, jobs into our hospital. And when people get in our hospital, we invest in them moving from entry level uh, jobs to managers of departments and, and directors and that type thing. We also have some housing things going on. But we also, as the president of the Mid-Atlantic, um, uh, uh, Kaiser said in, the, in her opening remarks, we also invest in the community. We invest in um, small businesses and things like that um, because that is where people we see in the hospital come from. So we're trying to invest in uh, building more inclusive, sustainable local economies at the exact same time. So just transferring what you see into people even switching socioeconomic lanes, focusing on economic mobility and financial literacy and things for people. Thank you, Thea. We, we often say it, it takes an ecosystem um, uh, of, of interventions uh, and transformation uh, to, to change the conditions that allow um, violence to, to emerge. Um, I'd love to hear, Greg, Tim, you reflect on what ecosystem level work means to you. Uh, where have you seen it show up? Greg, I know you, um, in addition to being an incredible organizer, have worked with cities and for cities. Um, what, what do you see that work um, entail? And, and Tim, just your reflections as you've uh, funded, certainly, and discussed these ecosystem approaches. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I think the simplest way to look at it is we need an all of community and all of government approach. And uh, a big aha moment for me was when I was first doing violence intervention work, we did ride alongs with law enforcement and uh, the police officer, as soon as we pulled up to the first block, he said, look at all this. And I'm the only one from the government here. And I, that was a huge light bulb moment because we're throwing the, the weight of all of the struggles in our communities on just one part of government. And we're allowing employment services to get away with not doing their part. Our education system to get away without doing their part. Our medical system for getting away with not doing their part. But we're waiting for something bad to happen and then law enforcement and the criminal legal system steps in. And so. Um, I think that ecosystem is really about looking at everything a community needs, and we have great examples all over the world, <laughs> but looking at what that community needs and figuring out how can we provide that for each individual um, and looking at every agency, every community group, um, and frankly, every community member to be a part of that ecosystem of creating a healthier, safer lifestyle. Um, so that's a kind of simple way to do it. I could rattle off specific <laughs> models and stuff, but um, but just an all of government, all of community approach to really invest and pour into a community. You you uh, just follow a question down the cut to you, Tim. You've um, your organization's actually created a scorecard. Is that yeah. right? Uh, so yes. let's talk about that. Yes. Um, so one thing we saw when we started talking about this more and more, a lot of cities just didn't know where to start, um, and a lot of cities were starting to invest, but they were pouring it all into street intervention or all into hospital intervention, um, but wasn't really understanding that this is more than just intervening the conflict. It's helping someone navigate out of that conflict and into a healthier lifestyle and also shifting the culture. And there are many models and many things you can do to intervene and reduce risk factors and start to address the root causes. And we kept saying it and saying it and eyes would glaze over. And so we, uh, we decided to create a report card. It's called the City Violence 
uh, Prevention Index Report. And we look at the three layers, intervention, what can be done, what models are out there, and what is the city invested in? Uh, strategies to reduce the risk factors that lead to a violent conflict. What are the programs that we've seen work? What, what is the city investing in? And then lastly, strategies that are aimed at addressing some of the root causes like economic opportunity or housing instability, what's happening across the country, and then is this city investing in it? And it was just a checklist. And you would, you would have thought, uh, you would have thought we were Mozart or something when we rolled this out. They were like, whoa, this is so amazing. I'm like, well, you know, it's not that amazing. It's just a, <laughs> just a checklist. Um, but we put a lot of effort into it, and we found cities that were looking for a strategy and looking for a plan and looking for ideas. Uh, and we also saw cities that were trying really hard um, and were doing really well but weren't getting the recognition they deserved. And we also saw some cities that were talking a good game, but their dollars weren't being put where, where it was needed. And so... Uh, a lot of folks loved it. Some hated it. Uh, but it was also in the USA Today, so you had to deal with it. Uh, so I encourage you all to check out that report. It was the top 50 cities. Uh, we're going to expand it to the top 100 cities this year. Um, so we're excited about that. And we're excited to also start to compare the level of investment to what's needed in that community and not just whether or not you're doing a hospital program, but how much of your resources are meeting the needs of that set community or the tragedy there. Yeah, on, on the question of ecosystem, you know, I think there's a lot of a lot of components here. You know, first and foremost, from our view, it's how do we uh, uh, take down the silos of the different essential elements that are needed to reduce violence and, and gun violence in our communities? So first and foremost, we now have this surge in research. That research is um, teaching us a lot of things, uh, and there's still a lot of open questions. But how do we connect and translate that research to essential practitioners, another element of that ecosystem, um, you know, whether they be healthcare providers or other community-based organizations. Um, you then have a, the law enforcement uh, component of, of that ecosystem, and how are they going to be good partners you know, with um, uh, the healthcare or community-based organizations? Um, you have individuals, right? Uh, as we mentioned earlier, you know, suicide represents a significant portion of, of gun violence. And you know, as we're learning things in the research, it's being translated. How is it that we are then going to be able to design and implement different intervention points for those folks along that spectrum? Right. And those intervention points are going to have to be unique to the circumstance, right. again, across all types of gun violence. And so that ecosystem then is combining all of these learnings and engagements. And then it needs to have a feedback loop that goes all the way back to the research in the first place, because then those research questions are going to be informed, they're going to be updated, and then we're going to need to invest in it. And that's really where then policymakers come in. They need to be able to fund and, and drive that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. We talked earlier about the volume of investment. You know, Greg has done great uh, work in increasing the volume of investment in community violence you know, intervention programs. But whether it be the research, the implementation, the translation, the direct service, all of these things are still falling down in terms of the level of investment necessary to scale them to the level that's that, that we need. Mm -hmm. So on the research side, you know, we did a study or we supported a study last year that tried to examine how much money do we need to invest in research over the next five years to close that gap. It's on the magnitude of about $600 million over the next five years. The federal government is currently investing about $25 million. You know, Greg mentioned how much money was going to be needed or, or, or likely needed to address those top 100 cities. And, you know, last year, the hobby, as you know, came out with a report that said, well, geez, we need at least $5 billion over eight years to be able to translate that research yep. to provide that service. Right. So the resourcing piece behind the ecosystem is one that I think we can't lose sight on. We have to design that feedback loop across all of those elements of it, and then we need to power it through more resourcing. That's right. Powerful. Thank you all. Uh, we just have a few minutes left, and I want to get to, I think, a theme that uh, we think is essential for the Kaiser Center for Gun Violence Research and Education, and something that you've all mentioned in your remarks, which is how we listen deeply uh, to the needs of survivors, how we listen deeply uh, to the needs of those in whose name we are doing this work. So I'd like to ask you, if you were to advise um, in your institution or the health sector in general about what it means to do that work authentically uh, and intentionally to advance research, what would you advise? What would you say? What do you think is critical to ensure that research happens with that at the center? I don't have anyone start. Well, I think the first thing is hire them. <laughs> you hire know? them, I yeah. mean, there are researchers across the country who have been impacted by violence or have lost family members or survivors themselves. 
Um, and they should be at the front of the line, in my opinion, of who we hire, who we contract, who we invest in to start analyzing this effort. So I think the first step is there. I think, secondly, there's so many ways that those who are impacted are hungry to share. And we saw that through um, the Pathways program in D.C., where we work with uh, former folks who've been impacted by violence. And they're hungry to share their solutions. I know with me, when I was in the hospital, I was so frustrated, but I also wanted to share mm. and start, start working on how to fix things. And so especially in hospital-based environments with intervention programs, with our street outreach organizations, with our uh, at-risk or behavioral therapy programs, every day they're working with individuals impacted. And those individuals impacted have a wealth of ideas and real-life experiences that can inform what we need to see done. So I would say, one, hire researchers that are impacted. Two, uh, partner with groups who are already doing the work. And three, don't underestimate the power of those who have been impacted. Because I honestly believe our greatest solutions and greatest advocacy has, has, was born with them. Thank you. I mean, I, that's absolutely right. You know, giving space uh, to allow those conversations is essential. But the space alone um, is not enough. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks uh, that rightfully are, you know, concerned or perhaps just don't trust um, you know, whether it be law enforcement or researchers or those that are trying to um, uh, address the, the issue. And building that trust is essential uh, to be able to then create that effective, you know, feedback loop. You know, we recently supported a study um, that uh, tried to examine why people were carrying guns in the west side of Chicago. And one of the key reasons was they said, listen, we don't trust law enforcement, right? They're not going to protect us, so we need to carry firearms. Mm. Yeah. And I think the same is true here in terms of how we think about the interventions. Yeah. Gun owners don't want to just hear from some gun control advocate, you know, how it is they think they should possess or handle or store their firearm. They need trusted messengers mm. who, um, uh, who have built trust over time. And the public health healthcare community is precisely that in many instances. And so I think that that's why you need to think about who are the right messengers to then give space um, to create that feedback loop. I, I agree with um, both of you. And I, um, I really do. And uh, you're, you're so right about, you know, getting getting the trust involved. I mean, I think even like uh, the COVID vaccine is a perfect example. You know, mm -hmm. people didn't trust the vaccine. And it's, you know, people often reflect back on like Tuskegee or something. But it's every single day it's what you engage and what you experience every single day. That makes you not trust, like not putting the vaccination sites where where they were most needed, for example. But um, I, I also feel like from the very beginning, when research, when a res when you're designing a research question, I think the people you're studying should be there. They should be right there because even as a researcher studying a population, you can only design your question based upon what you know about that population, and even interpret your data based upon what you know. And generally, people don't know the population. So I think they should be involved at the table from start to finish and not just invite one person to let there be more of them than you even so that you can leverage the value that they can bring versus there being a lopsided, you know, number and a power differential and that type thing. Power. Oh, Greg, go ahead, please. And, we, and I, honestly, one quick thing, we've got to push back on the common kind of... Um, stereotypes about where great researchers come from. Like North Carolina A&T, to me, can do a greater job at this than Yale, right? Howard University can run laps around Harvard when we're thinking about the trauma of black communities. And I think if we recognize that this crisis is impacting, especially homicide, overwhelmingly black and brown folks, then we should go to those institutions that are made up of black and brown folks. And so I just want to challenge the room uh, this is the organizer in me, challenge everyone <laughs> to kind of fight back against the kind of traditional hierarchy of institutions and realize that the, the real wisdom um, is in those communities and in a lot of institutions that get overlooked for this research. It's powerful. So I'm hearing we've got to ensure that folks are there to interpret the data, not just to listen, but to, but to be there to actually analyze and interpret. And that requires trust. It requires going to the places where researchers are, hiring them, compensating them for their time, um, and continuing to do this at scale. Powerful comments here. Thank you all so much for joining us. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to all, 
all of our panelists. That was really an outstanding um, and riveting discussion. Uh, I, I found that so impactful and so informative, so thank you. We're gonna be moving to our second panel here, and I'd like to introduce our moderator, uh, Dr. Megan Rainey. Uh, Megan is a, is a leader in firearm research uh, and is uh, currently serving as Deputy Dean at the Brown School of Public Health and is also a practicing uh, emergency uh, physician. So I'd like to welcome Megan and all the panelists on panel two, which um, is going to be focusing on opportunities to advance research and data quality uh, to address firearm violence. Welcome to all of you and thank you for being here. Thank you, David. It is a joy and a delight to be here on this exciting day. I'll let the panelists, all friends and colleagues, make it good to see you, Jeff, make their way out. I'm gonna do a really brief introduction of the three panelists. My guess is, is that you all know them already. Um, and I could probably talk for a half hour about each of them. Instead, I'm gonna do about 30 seconds and then we're gonna get into the discussion. Um, so f uh, I'll do first is Dr. Joe Richardson, who is the Joel and Kim Feller Professor of African American Studies and Anthropology at the University of Maryland. Professor Richardson is known for his qualitative research studies on gun violence and trauma among young black men, for his leadership of the Capital Region Violence Intervention Program, and a thing that probably many of us know him for is as executive producer and director of the award-winning documentary series, Life After the Gunshot, which I encourage you to seek out if you have not seen it. Second, Dr. Rochelle Dicker, professor of surgery and anesthesia at UCLA and the trauma medical director there. She co-directs the program for the advancement of surgical equity and most important for this, she started the San Francisco Wraparound Project almost 20 years ago, which is extraordinary, and currently serves as the board chair of the hobby. Last but certainly not least, Dr. Daniel Webster, a giant in our field, uh, who is the Bloomberg Professor of American Health and distinguished scholar, most recently director of, the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Solutions. For more than three decades, Professor Webster has led studies on gun violence and prevention strategies that have informed policy at the local, state, and federal level. He's also led the Homicide Review Commission in Baltimore, has received Baltimore City Leaderships in Health Equity Award, and has been a recipient of the APHA David Rall Award for science-based advocacy. So it is a true joy to join the three of you up here. For the sake of time, I'm gonna uh, set kind of direct questions at each of the three of you. I'm gonna do one for each and then we're gonna engage in a bit of discussion. Um, I'm gonna start uh, actually, Daniel, with you. Since the topic of our discussion is about opportunities to advance research, one thing that many of us bemoan are the holes in data. Um, and so I'd love to kind of start with hearing from you about your experiences working with data in firearm injury, strengths and weaknesses, you know, in five minutes or less. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could speak for a while on this topic and, and maybe get into a little bit of a rant. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, wow, what a great panel we just had. It's really cool following that. Yeah. Um, so th the data, much of the discussion thus far has focused on the dollars, how, m how much we are investing in the research, which is really important. But as a researcher who's been doing this for a while, we're so dependent upon the data and our data really are in inadequate. And we talk about system change, the systems are creating bad data that are not helpful in solving this very complex problem. So the data that the FBI collects that comes through local law enforcement has huge gaps particularly right now, roughly half of the United States is not reflected in the current data being collected by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mind-blowing. Um, yes, we have health systems that have great data, but they're not investigators. They can't tell us the context of those events. So what I find is particularly, so there's my rant. Now I'm going to get to the positive side. I really think uh, uh, Dr. Howry mentioned the Cardiff model. That's sort of a nice base, but there are other similar models of homicide shooting reviews that involve law enforcement, 
uh, public health, uh, community partners, social service agencies that really look at the data comprehensively, understand what's going on, and actually formulate solutions for decision makers at a local level and exactly to match what is, what is going on. And that is what I find particularly exciting and I hope we invest more in. It, it would be tremendous. It's difficult to imagine us applying the public health model without either knowing where we're starting from or what sort of improvements we're making or not. So I love that. It's a great call to action for all of us, building off of Gregory's community organizer. <laughs> Let's all go do something with it. Um, the next question I'm going to direct to you, Dr. Dicker. Uh, how do we measure value in hospital-based and hospital-linked violence prevention programs? I know you and I have had discussions about this. Many of the people in the audience have had discussions about this. And how can we think differently about the outcomes? This will build off of what Dr. James mentioned earlier. No doubt it does. Um, and I just want to say how incredibly privileged I feel to be standing up here, sitting up here with these panelists, with Dr. Rennie, with the last panelists, and just to be here um, with Kaiser Permanente and all of you. Um, I, I think that we have to do a complete paradigm shift, and Dr. James spoke to this, and so did, uh, and so did Fatima Dreyer, our executive director at the Javi. She said something really great that I had to write down. Research is lagging behind community wisdom. Mm. And so we have to be, as Greg Jackson said, we have to be not just community informed, but community centered in how we look at value. We have to be, as Dr. James taught us, we have to be asset based. To be thinking just about re-injury instead of about thinking about how we're changing people's life course is misdirected. So I would encourage in the future, and we've made this, we've made this mistake in the past, I would encourage in the future that we think about value in terms of how we have addressed root causes and how we have changed people's life courses. Have we been able to, through credible messengers, reach educational opportunities, investment opportunities for our communities? So measuring that value is key to young investigators and to funders. And then on top of that, absolutely being community-centered and promoting scholars who are people of color. And that will create this paradigm shift that's so necessary in our field. Uh, and I'll put a plug out for the Javi there. You guys have done a wonderful job of, coal, you know, so often you'll get questions from folks that are starting a hospital-based violence intervention program and have no idea how to begin to measure outcomes. And you all have a wonderful compendium of resources, which serves as a, a great kind of library for the field for a starting point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Richardson, you know, reflecting off of the last panel as well as the work of the other two folks up here, I think one of the things that many of us are dedicated to and try our best to do is to make sure that the community is not just participating in, but is a core partner in potentially driving our research. I think that you have done a particularly good job of walking the walk in this. And so I'd love your thoughts on how, you know, what lessons the folks in the audience and those listening online can take away around involving community really as, as co-creators from, from the first conception through the end of a project. Sure, uh, thank you. And uh, I thank uh, Kaiser Permanente as well as Ahavi for inviting me and for my team panelists. So I actually wanna uh, dovetail on, on Greg's points as well as uh, on Dr. James' points as well in terms of how we get people involved. But before I do that, I would be remiss not to say this because I think it's very tangential to what I'm gonna discuss. I was, I was talking to Dr. Dicker before we uh, approached the stage and we arrived here early, and I mentioned to her that this is the second time that I've been in this room. Uh, and the first time I was in this room was actually two years ago. I had to give a, a, a graduation speech for a young man that was in my hospital violence intervention program that was killed, and he was uh, a participant in a program called Run, Run Hope Work, which was a program designed for high-risk DC youth would provide training in construction and IT. And so I had to actually come and give his graduation speech and actually receive his certificate for him. So I would be remiss not to discuss why it's so important that we have young people who are researchers involved in the work that we do. When I started this work, I initially um, 
conducted a study at Prince George's Hospital Center, which led to the uh, development and implementation of an HVIP. And one of the young men in my study, uh, we formed a relationship, and ultimately he became the violence intervention specialist for the program, in which approaching young people at bedside, and one of the young men we approached was the young person I mentioned who was unfortunately killed. And from that relationship, we developed also a researcher-practitioner relationship. So you mentioned Life After the Gunshot, which is a documentary I shot, and no pun intended, but um, he was also the executive producer. And so for, for me, it's about having people from the very beginning, as, as Dr. James mentioned, to be able to meet someone at bedside, go from bedside to violence intervention specialist to executive producer of a documentary and a researcher that I work with. And if you look at my CV, he's on many of my articles, mm. right? And so um, this is a shameless plug. Uh, there was an article which I recently published in Anthropology. Now it's called The Cosign. And it's, and it's about how gun violence researchers, particularly the front line, who we need to train and uplift can serve as a valuable resource and important gun violence researchers in a space where we often don't think about specific questions. And so for the young men that I work with who are also the amazing gun violence researchers, we should be training them and including them in our studies in order to ask those questions which we have blind spots on. And so um, it's about from the very beginning until the very end, and I think you know, having that, going through that process with many of the young people that I work with has been important and instrumental to uplifting a very nuanced knowledge that we may not necessarily get if we then uh, cultivate those relationships. I, I love that. And I'm actually going to go off of that. I think one of the things that all four of us and all of you in the room who I know um, do so well is to cross disciplinary boundaries. You know, each of us have grown up in and been trained in or had the lived experience of whatever our life is. And it's so easy to have blinders on and think that that model or that training or that world is the only way to think about the solutions of the problem. I would actually love to hear from each of you. I, this was not one of the prepped questions, so hopefully you can you can go with me. But I would I would love to hear from you about kind of one surprising transdisciplinary boundary um, that you've created um, that you think has really enhanced the ability to do impactful work. You know, we've already identified community. Um, we've identified law enforcement officers. Um, would, would love to hear you survivors. Um, tell me about kind of what, what's one that you never thought that you were going to do that's been just neat. That, that's hard. I mean, for, for me, um, what I've sort of straddled the world of public health and criminology, yeah. and so um, it's really been interesting over a 30 year span to see actually some coming together. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now I can go to criminology meetings and they're talking public health stuff, which is so cool. <laughs> um, but, but actually I think some of the biggest insights I've gotten is just talk, talking to the people closest to the problem, a homicide detective, a violence interrupter, mm -hmm. It's the insights that I've gotten through those sort of relationships is really, I think, has helped me expand and understand the problem far better than I ever would have. So um, just, again, it's sort of a theme of we got to get really close to what the problem is and understand from various vantage points uh, what those challenges are and what those opportunities look like. I love that. It, it is close. So I'll actually put a plug out. Uh, we had our first ever, and I'm going to mess up the exact, we have the Society for Violence or for Firearm Injury Prevention Research, which is, right. we just had our first ever meeting in December. And it was really, there were a lot of criminologists there. Joe was there. Right. I didn't see you, Rochelle, but it was, no. it's always a long flight for you. So. <laughs> it's a long flight. Next year, it'll be in the middle of the country. Oh, but, perfect. Anyhow. <laughs> So um, I, I love that question, and, and I agree with Daniel, and thank you for asking that impromptu, really important question, as you always know to do, Megan. 
Um, so uh, I always think when I'm talking to young researchers, because now I've been doing this a little while, mm -hmm. um, how important three elements are. Humility, humanity, relevance. And how do you get to that? And humility, humanity are wrapped up in what Greg Jackson's experience was. And what his experience was, was completely unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So what that drives you to do if you're in the trauma bay is to talk to Greg about his experience and understand through his eyes how quality needs to happen instead of re-traumatization. And then you start opening up to ideas about trauma-informed care and how to study it and how to make it a reality in all the trauma centers across the country. So like Daniel said, get to it. Get to the people who are feeling it and experiencing it every day. And, um, and I'll tell you one really quick story about that. And this changed the mindset that now I preach. Um, I had a young man who was violently injured and in part of the wraparound project in San Francisco. And, uh, and he was with us for many months and got a really great job at an arborist program in the city. Mm. And he went back home one night. He, he got to the point where he was a supervisor in this, and he was teaching middle schoolers how to plant trees and had a really great job. Um, and he, he actually continued with that job, but there was an intermediate. He was re-injured. He was shot again on his way home from work and came back to San Francisco General Hospital. So re-injury, check mark, outcome, no. His life course had still changed to the positive. So after having conversations with him about this event, it became really clear to him that he found value in the program and what his life course and trajectory was at that point. So we have to be creative and talk to the people who actually are feeling this, this structural racism in our country to understand how to go on as researchers in an asset-based way. I love that. The, both um, the perspective on humility and those, those relationships kind of uh, not just within our research, but also the impact on that day-to-day -day care, which the prior panel commented on, um, and, and the asset-based based approach. Imagine if we all took that lens to our work. I know. Um, Dr. Richardson. So I, I would definitely say without question, um, social work. Mm. Um, and anyone who knows me, I'm, I'm trained as a criminologist in, 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 in medical anthropology, but I show up at all the social work conferences. And I think many people assume that I was trained in social work. So I, I would start with social work first. But um, I think the most uh, interesting and exciting part about doing the work in the gun violence research space is the amazing conversations you can have with people outside of your discipline. And so yesterday, um, I've been tasked with developing a gun violence uh, initiative at University of Maryland, nice. and we were on a call with uh, the director of the Brain and Behavior Initiative, which we were just trying to uh, pick her brain in terms of how did they start the initiative? What resources did they use, et cetera? And at the end of the conversation, she says to me, you know, Joe, I have two neuroscientists that are really interested in gun violence work, and they do a lot of work on how trauma affects the brain, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so that really was the kind of conversations that I want to have and how we can expand the work that we're doing. The other thing is, um, I had an, another study conducted years ago. We did secondary data analysis on the risk factors for repeat violent injury. And so I revisited the, that data set and I reached out to one of the uh, computer scientists at my school. And we started working on a, a, a predictive model using AI. Mm -hmm. Now we didn't have enough data points, so ultimately we didn't get to complete the study. But she was really engaged in wanting to create, she really wanted to create this model. And so I think for us, it's, it's about extending the boundaries beyond our like traditional partners, mm -hmm. beyond just social work and the social science. Not that they're not important, but we also need to be talking to schools of engineering. Like how do you create a smart gun? How do you, how do you can you create a better artificial intelligence model? How can you speak to neuroscientists in ways where we can understand how the brain is impacted through exposure to trauma, 
And so those are the, those are the things that I'm really trying to push the boundaries on in terms of um, multidisciplinary work. I, I love that. I will say I was uh, recently talking to a um, applicant for, PH, for uh, a PhD program who's been working on the effect of lead exposure, right, which is right. not surprising to any of us that do work around, who, who kind of know pediatrics, know that lead exposure is associated with a host of downstream effects, and certainly the Flint water crisis highlighted it, but there's all kinds of fascinating analyses. Again, one of those things where you go, ah, oh, this might be right, a different way of approaching the problem. Right. I, I feel like right now is this moment where we have an opportunity for a real paradigm shift, where we've done the work over the last 30 years, uh, but particularly, I think, in the last 15 of really shoring up this public health approach to firearm injury. There's so much more to do in implementing that, but it's also a moment to kind of create that, that paradigm shift, which will actually lead to my last question to the panel. Uh, again, I'll do the same question for all three of you in our last five minutes. When you do think about a paradigm shift in research around, you know, if, if you could think about some problem, and you've kind of alluded it to it already, Joe, if you could think of some issue that you feel like would just kind of transform the field, what would it be? And you may not be able to come up with one, and it doesn't have, this is, does not have to be your forever answer either. No pressure. You can change it tomorrow. Um, but it would be fun to think about, like, what, what thing do you think is kind of just within reach or, or maybe a little further out that would be transformative for this work, for this country? Uh, Dr. Webster. I'll, yeah. I'll start. Thank you. Um, <laughs> tough question. <laughs> um, I'd be a know. good journalist. What can I say? No, okay. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think this applies across a lot of uh, approaches to gun violence prevention. Mm -hmm. I think we've been stuck for a while. Mm -hmm. We've been doing very similar things, and, and I'll, I'll own this on the research side too, for a very long time and getting very comfortable. And we haven't adapted and innovated the way we should. The example that I'm thinking of that is most profoundly absent mm -hmm. in large part, there's a little bit on it, but is the influence of social media on gun violence. Mm -hmm. And we have violence interrupters uh, in Baltimore and in cities all across the country uh, doing brave, heroic work they have phones and they're trying to see what's going on, but you know what? We need to up that game, up the supports mm -hmm. that we give, whether it's somebody working in an HVIP program or a community violence intervention, to really elevate, let's really um, very quickly respond to escalating things and de-escalate them before they start the gunfire. Yep. If we could do that, that would be transformative. I love that. And I do want to give a shout out to Desmond Patton, who yes. is doing a fair amount of awesome work um, in this area, as well as uh, Nina Vinnick, who used to be at the Joyce Foundation, who's doing some really interesting work around this. Um, Dr. Dicker. I'm going to, I know time is limited, yeah. but I still need to pick two. Um, <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> so, uh, so one is around a lot of the work that Thea James is doing at Boston Medical Center around mm -hmm. economic justice. Uh, investment in the healthcare sector into disenfranchised communities will transform. Health and wealth are completely interrelated. That's number one. It's a big one. The second one is, and I learned this from one of my violence prevention professionals in San Francisco, Mike Texada, unless you get somebody to a certain mental wellness, mm -hmm. finding employment, finding better educational opportunities and so forth um, is a really tough climb. So addressing with cultural humility um, the mental health crisis in our country is absolutely essential um, in our violence prevention work. I love it. Thank you. Um, and, and as someone who feels like I want to, Dr. Dr. Gina South at Penn, also when we think about kind of that economic justice and environmental transformation, also doing amazing work. Dr. Richardson. So I, I want to shout out uh, Dr. Erin Hall because this is actually her million dollar idea and I'm just on for the ride. Right <laughs> That's so the if best you're watching Aaron, I'm shouting you out. Uh, and Dr. Chris Saintville. So I think um, really capturing the overall health of black men, mm. right? Um, it's, it's, it's important that we address trauma recidivism and, and the intersection of the criminal justice system, but also I think uh, a much more 
comprehensive study on the health of black men mm -hmm. prior to the injury and post injury because what we often will find is that even if we had the best interventions to reduce trauma recidivism or early violent mortality that young black men would still die at an early rate right due to all the other comorbid diseases that young black men may ultimately have so whether it's you know, hypertension or diabetes or, or liver disease. These are things that we are aware of when young people who are injured come into a hospital setting. We have that data, but let, yet we let people walk out of the door, mm. right? Knowing that they have all of these other comorbid disorders and we never address them at all. And so if we really want to think about just in terms of structural violence, like the system is actually violent in that way. Right. And so I think having a much more robust uh, now, uh, studies on on black men in health and health outcomes is is critically important. That moves beyond just the shooting, because what we find in, our, in our, any discussion that I've had is like the level of vicarious and and the effects of trauma and what that has on the body physiologically. Mm -hmm. We don't really understand that completely yet. So. Thank you. That that, that's a wonderful way to end uh, this discussion with a call for structural change. I could keep talking to all three of you for hours. I know that I will in the future, um, but this has been an absolute delight and privilege to get to be up here with you. A huge thank you to KP for making this possible and to the Javi as well for their longtime leadership and partnership. Um, it's an absolute privilege and honor to be here today. So thank you and onwards, as Garen Wintemute would say. <laughs> thank you. Well, it's my job to, to close us out, and it's difficult to do because uh, this feels like a family reunion, and so I want it to keep going on and on, but I'll, I'll do my best to summarize. Um, in, in addition to our in-person audience, I just wanted to acknowledge over 350 people joined uh, and tuned in for, for this convening today. So I just want to acknowledge we had an incredible turnout. Thank you all so much for, for joining us. Um, there were a number of things that I heard today. I just wanted to share a few of those highlights. In 26 minutes, I would have been dead. We need to listen to those closest to the problem. Humility, humanity, relevance. Asset-based approaches. We must build trust. It takes interdisciplinary engagement. Predictive analysis and AI, a call for structural change. These are just a few of a sea of opportunities and possibilities, uh, not only now, but in the future. And as I said before, it's going to take all of us because this work is big. It is the work of generations for us to stop violence, not only here, but around the world. And I believe that we can lead the way. I wanna encourage all of you as we go back into our lives to continue to spread the word that the health sector does indeed have a role to play in ending violence. Continue to tweet, share, amplify as much as you can. Your message can help us turn the corner and encourage those on the sidelines, who've been on the sidelines for quite a long time, who didn't know that there was a way to enter this fight and be a part of it. Your message can help shift and ensure that we have more people, more champions, to support our work in the long term. I want to just, with the bottom of my heart, thank each speaker, panelist today. I'm so deeply moved by your words and encouraged by a lifetime of work you've dedicated to this field. Thank you for the Center of, for Total Health for hosting our event today. It's a beautiful space. Please do take a look around. Uh, and I just want to say we are, we are incredibly uh, poised and ready. We require partnership. And with, uh, with the Kaiser Center for Gun Runs Research and Education, we're ready. So 
Please join me in, in a final goodbye. We have a uh, reception uh, just uh, behind us past registration. Uh, and thank you all once more.